I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett. Welcome to Local Matters. Photography is a powerful language that with one single image can transmit volumes of story and emotion. Plymouth resident Ed Newt has been mastering this language for over 30 years, focusing his lens on subjects ranging from natural landscapes, portraiture, to commercial food photography but always to tell a story. The local scene visited Ed's studio to learn more about his story, his work, and what life has been like behind the camera. A friend of mine uh, was avoiding the, the draft in the 60s, you know how old I am, and he was getting rid of things and he gave me his camera. And I found that I could do with the camera what I couldn't do. I'm left-handed and I was drawing, but I was smudging it. So I found, coincidentally, what I could do with that, what I saw with the camera and do that. And I shot some film. And the first roll of film, I probably had two or three pictures that people liked. And I went, hmm. So, another roll of film. And when you get that pos positive response, at a, I was probably 16 or 17 years old. I said, OK, there's something. And I kept dabbling at it. And, uh, pursued it. I fell into it, I was comfortable with it, I had confidence in it, and I've been able to uh, parlay that for 50 odd years, uh, being just very, very lucky to do what I do here in Plymouth for over 40 years. And um, if, you, if you do something long enough, you should get better at it. And I'm still learning. Every day I'm still learning uh, with digital or whatever I'm doing. Uh, so. The process continue, continues. I just, uh, I still, I try to shoot every day. There's probably not one day that goes by that I don't do something photography related. And it's never been work to me. It's been difficult work at times, but it's, 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 it's just been great. I, I, I've been very, very lucky. I grew up in Bryantville, which is part of Pembroke, and um, uh, lived there and um, wanted to uh, get out of there when I was younger. And so I was looking at different ways of, of doing that and um, wanted to be a musician for a while. I was a drummer when I was a kid. And uh, I, I kid that you know, Ringo had the job that I wanted, so that took care of that. I, I've always connected music and photography in, in the sense of the creative process. Uh, when you're doing a, a commercial photo shoot, you meet with the client and you start with an idea and then you start to photograph that and maybe that idea goes from here to here. And with music, it's the same way. You, you have a chord change and you're sitting with a group of friends and you're playing. That, that chord change will go from one degree to another and it will be totally different from where you started it. So I've always found photography and music being my two passions, I guess you could say. But also, it, it, a lot of it's the same. You look at a photo and you want people to remember it. You play a song, you want people to remember it. And I've often thought, how many times have you heard a song and you hear it all day long? If you can take a picture like that, that sticks in people's heads, then you know, it's, it's, it, they're the same in a way. And you want to move people with what you do, whether it's cooking or writing or photography or music. They're all, you want a response. What's the point if you don't get a response? It's kind of like, it's, I, I like it when people don't like my photos because I get more of a kick out of that because I learn from that. And so there's a parallel between any creative process. Around 1979, uh, Ocean Spray, their corporate headquarters was right down the street here on Water Street. And <clears throat> to date myself, I had a dark room in my house, a black and white dark room. And this young man, uh, a good friend, Jack Candy, called me and said, can you develop a roll of film? And I could. It was 35 millimeter. Went over to them, met them. And Ocean Spray at that point was starting to really expand. And most of the people there were, were my age. And I went over and we hit it off. Well, that started a relationship of photographing their new employees. And all coincidence. Everything is, in my life has been coincidence. So one day they said, can you photograph a cranberry muffin? And I went, yeah, okay. And I got it, I had a little studio in my garage in Kingston. 
I put the cranberry muffin down. It didn't move, which I like because I don't like things that move. And uh, I took a pretty good shot of it. And then they gave me another job and another job. And uh, my dad coincidentally happened to be a cook. I, I mean, who doesn't love food? I love food. And it kind of snowballed, not snowballed, but it kind of evolved from that. And then someone left Ocean Spray and went to uh, Whole Foods, well, bread, bread and Circus at the time. And I started working for them. And another person left Ocean Spray and went to Welch's Grape Juice. And back then, there was a really nice communal, I know a guy kind of thing. And I, it was not intentional, but I felt very comfortable doing it because people always say, oh, food photography is incredibly difficult. I don't find it difficult. I find photographing Larry Bird would be impossible for me to do. And I connected with it and it grew from there. And that's in, and I'm still doing food today. Um, did a couple shoots about a month ago with a new barbecue place in North Plymouth called Bark. And uh, I've got a little bit of a reputation as a food photographer, but I'm a commercial portrait photographer, really, with a leaning towards food. I love the food photography that I do. When that works, it's great. So it, it depends on what I'm doing. I've never really thought of myself as one type of photographer. I'm not a landscape photographer, but I've done it. I'm not a portrait photographer, but I do portraits. So it depends on what kind of, what you see, what comes your way. If you keep shooting, you're always looking. And I'm always looking, even when I'm driving the car. I'll see something out of the corner of my eye and maybe go back the next day. I was, I was doing some work in Pine Hills and I happened to see a group of trees. And I said, I gotta go back there. So a couple of days later, all this humidity came into the air. And I went down there and I got about 10 shots that were just beyond my wildest expectation. But because I happened to see that when I was there a day before. So you kind of file that away. Okay, that's a cool spot. And I think any photographer is always looking. You're not going to reinvent the wheel. You're not going to. But maybe you can show somebody something they've seen from a little different point of view. The night shots I've been doing recently, I've been getting a lot of compliments of people going, geez, I like that angle of what you're doing. I didn't look at that road that way or those set of lights that way. I photographed the, the train station in the cordage and did some shots and people love them and it's, it's all abandoned, but the light is beautiful. You've got these. So if you can do that, um, so you're always on the look uh, and, and I don't think that ever changes no matter how long you've been shooting. Any business has evolved, like a writer doesn't write on a typewriter anymore. Uh, musicians don't record on tape anymore. And photography has evolved to the same degree. Probably 30 years ago, I would go to trade shows in Boston and they had all printers and there'd be one guy in the corner who was selling digital photography. This is like 30 years ago. He had a camera that was like this big. And the poor guy was over there and I was talking to him. And you were shooting an image that was like that big. It was like one megapixel maybe. And I just said, this is never gonna happen in my lifetime. I'll be retired by that. Well then, 10 or 15 years later, all that technology came together. The quality went up and the price came down. And my clients at the time dictated that I needed to do that. And I did it. I was lucky I was in a building in Plymouth here with some younger people that knew more about it than I, and they helped me a lot. And I embraced it. It's, it's um, there's a great quote by Neil Young, which is very topical right now. He was touring with Pearl Jam years ago. And someone said, why are you touring with Pearl Jam? And he says, well, you either get on the bus or the bus goes by you. And that's what I did. I'm on the digital bus. And it, it's, it's a great tool. I miss part of what I did before, but you can't look behind, you have to look ahead and use that tool, that's what it is, to the best way you can and hopefully people like what you do. Thank you, Ed, for sharing your story. For more information about Ed's work, visit newtphotography.com or find him on Facebook and Instagram. STEM is the acronym for the subjects of science, technology, engineering, and math, and is essential education for young learners. Problem solving, critical thinking, and a thirst for innovation are STEM skills necessary for the future of work 
and human progress. With that in mind, the Kingston Public Library invites kids ages 7 to 12 to take part in their monthly STEM club, a program aimed at exploring aspects of STEM through fun and educational activities. The next STEM club will take place on March 24th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m when they'll apply engineering principles to the construction of towers and bridges using marshmallows as material. Visit the Kingston Public Library website to register. Nerd culture is cool culture now, as the word nerd has been redefined as a term of group identity and a source of well-earned pride. Sci-fi and fantasy, video and board games, technology, and similar topics create a large basis for community, and conversation. If you can relate, join fellow gamers, Trekkies, Middle Earthers, Potterheads, or other Nordcore adherents for Spoiler Alert, a nerd culture discussion group hosted by the Plymouth Public Library. It's all camaraderie and fun discussion on March 28th from 6 to 7 p.m. in the library's boardroom. Visit the Plymouth Public Library website to learn more. You know that libraries are more than words. The library is also a community resource, helping us stay connected, entertained, and informed in our towns. In February, the Pembroke Public Library welcomed new library director Marcy Walsh O'Connor. Julie Thompson talked with Marcy about her career and what brought her here, and what's new and next for the Pembroke Public Library. I'm very pleased to welcome Marcy Walsh O'Connor, who's the new director of the Pembroke Public Library. So excited to have you here. Now, you're filling some big shoes of Deborah Wall, who was in that position for uh, almost 20 years. So let's talk a little bit about your background and what brought you here. I know you, were, you started as a page in, in, in Rockland. You have a master's degree that you got from uh, Simmons College in 2009 in Library and Information Sciences. And you've both recently been the library director in Whitman. Talk about this whole process and how you got to where you are right now. Um, as a teenager, I was hanging out in the library as one of my safe places, and as a person who wasn't very extroverted and loved reading, that was one of my favorite places to hang out. And the director, uh, Janet Husband, came up to me and said, you're here a lot. Do you want to get paid to be here? <laughs> and I said, sure. And I was a page there for several years going through like college. And I worked at my undergrad college library and it was it was fun and exciting but I thought it was just something kids did or mm -hmm. very older women because <laughs> I didn't see that like person in their 40s or 30s working there right that was it was teenagers and women over 60 okay. and that was it um, so I got my undergrad in psychology and I did some social work um, and then I ended up getting very burnt out on the social work aspect. Yeah, yeah. And I ended up, one of my old library staff friends called me and she said, I have an opening in Rockland. I know you got your start here. I think you'd be amazing at it. Why don't you come interview for me? I got the job. I ended up um, working um, there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm started my master's in Simmons, worked at a college right next to Simmons, Mass College of Pharmacy, and I loved it. Right. And knew that, and being in college at Simmons was definitely one of those things where you're like, these are all my people. Right. Where right. were you? Yeah, right. <laughs> and it was, it was a very much more diverse population than I had been used to in libraries, all yeah. ages, all genders, sure. all, all different people, and they were all like me, who loved reading, but also loved other things of libraries that were just starting to come out. Right. Like that a library was a safe place for people. And it wasn't just for those introverts. It was for underserved populations. It was for people that were struggling to find even just tax forms or computer help. And these were things that were slowly coming out in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And to be a I remember sitting with a, a patron who was a, a gentleman and older, and he ended up just needing to set up an email so his grandchildren could email him. Yeah. And like I set it up for him. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful and wonderful. He 
like called me over and he like read the email from his grandchild to me and it was just wow it was wonderful and it made and, a difference in his life yeah right and it wasn't it didn't have anything to do with books and but it's can it's, and I, you know it's connecting, and that's what libraries. Yes. The bottom line is, is libraries connect, and it doesn't matter if you're two or if you're 102. Libraries are right. kind of a connectivity for everybody. Let's talk about the the Pembroke Library. Um, it has multiple offerings for all ages. Things like a book club. It has movie matinees, exhibits, displays, Lego club, story time. There's, I mean, there's not a day that goes by that there isn't something unique going on in the library. You also have a, uh, people have the ability to borrow things, anything from a sewing machine to a ukulele, which is okay, strange, right? You don't think of, of a yes. library as that. So, talk to me about how vast the library's services have actually become. It's, I, I once had a town manager not here explain to me that you can't be all things for all people. And I said, watch me. Good for you. <laughs> um, we, we have hot spots. We, we have, we just bought a karaoke machine to circulate. We have a circuit printer for all those people that love all those vinyl cutouts. Yeah. Of, that you put on your wall or you put on your coffee cup. I mean, the ability to have the funding and the support to do these things in Pembroke is, it just blows my mind every day. And that when I have a staff that comes in and asks me for something and I say, let's figure out how to pay for this and let's do it. And it's just, it, it makes coming to work Wonderful. a blessing. Yeah. Now let me ask you this. How do you determine what activities or programs you're going to continue or even maybe expand and which ones have kind of come to the end of their their lifespan and you're going to put them away for a while well, how do you make that determination so one of the things that i really love and this is where like i kind of geek out a little bit is statistics <laughs> and now um most library most library users don't realize this but we keep statistics on everything and we keep them for the year we keep them for the fiscal year some of them we have to report I report to the trustees and they acknowledge that, you know, we're, we're going in the right direction or we need to address, you know, assess something. Yep. Some of them we have to report to the state mm -hmm. and some of them we have to even report to the federal government. So by keeping these statistics, I can determine that we're heading where we need to head and that certain things aren't working the way they need to be. Sure. So when I came in here, I came in to the building with a fresh set of eyes and, you know, I sat down with the staff and I was like, all right, what's working? What's not working? Mm -hmm. Let's see what we can figure out. Do we need three or four different categories of paperbacks? Do what's going on with the building? I think we need new windows. Mm -hmm. Is the heating system working as well as it could? Is this place a warm and friendly place to be? Yes, the staff is warm and friendly, but is the actual building warm right. enough? Right. These are all right. the things that we have to address and look at. And I will be assessing those throughout the year mm -hmm. and figuring out what's working and what's not working. And the staff has been phenomenal at us, like helping me say, I really want to do this program. Can we add this? And let's let's throw everything out and and start fresh, but also let's remember where we're coming from. Let's Absolutely. Figure out what's worked and let's still do those things. And how do you get um, intel from the community? Uh, do you request um, people to send ideas or or how can people say, hey, you know, I saw something at another library and I really like it to be tried at the Pembroke Library. How do people contact you about that? I, I love people stopping in my office. They can call, they can email me. Yep. I, I had a woman come in the other day and she just said, you know, this is the best library I've ever been in. Can we do a display for Ukraine materials if, if you have enough? And I said, sure, let's, let's figure this out. And so for me, getting that feedback is always great and wonderful. I, I mean, obviously everyone loves to hear that their staff is phenomenal. And, right. But I, I knew that, and I've known that since I walked the first day I walked in the building. But finding out from the community is one of my favorite things. And I plan to do surveys. I plan to do maybe focus groups even, figure out where we're 
where we're doing well and where we need to improve. Oh, good for you. So that's one of your one of your goals for 2022 is to really do a, a community assessment of the usage yes. of the library and the desires of the of the people that are in the community. That's wonderful. Um, so personally, you are married to uh, your wife, Erin. You have an 11 year old daughter, Ellie. You have four cats and a dog <laughs> and you work full time here at the library. How do you make it all work? Um, by having a very supportive spouse who loves my job almost as much as I do. And she every day makes sure that I can put my job when I need to put it first and when I need to focus on my family. I just got back from a vacation with the three of them, with the three of us and, and the dog. And it was, wonderful. you know, it's wonderful to have yeah. that time to decompress, but it's also, it's good to come back. And you come back energized. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good for you. Well, we are so thrilled to have you in Pembroke. Um, best of luck to you. I'm sure we'll, we'll meet with you again many times and we will follow what's going on in the Pembroke Public Library. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Thank you. Visit PembrokePublicLibrary.org to stay up to date on what's happening at the library. Mindfulness is the practice of being fully present in the moment without judgment or interpretation of yourself or your feelings and has myriad mental and physical health benefits. On March 16th from 9 to 11 a.m., join Wildlands Trust and meditation instructor Betsy Hall for a two-hour quiet and mindful walk through the rolling hills of the Emory Preserve. Participants will meet Betsy at the Davis Douglas Farm in Plymouth. This event is weather permitting and will run as a virtual meditation and mindfulness session if inclement weather occurs. To register, visit the Wildlands Trust website. King Philip's War is considered the bloodiest war per capita in U.S. history. Occurring in southern New England between 1675 and 76, it constituted Native people's last efforts to stop English settlement on their native lands and avoid coming under English rule. This bloody rebellion left several hundred colonists and dozens of English settlements heavily damaged or destroyed. Thousands of Native Americans were killed, wounded, or captured and sold into servitude. Learn more about this devastating war and its consequences on March 25th in a virtual event hosted by the Alden House Historic Site, when New York Times best-selling author Michael Tugius will present a talk on his book, King Philip's War, The History and Legacy of America's Forgotten Conflict. This presentation, beginning at 12 p.m., will include slides showing battle sites, period sketches, and historic markers, and discuss Native and colonial ways of life, events leading up to the war, and the war's battles and strategies applied. Funded by the Duxbury Cultural Council, this program will be broadcast through Zoom. Registration is required. Visit the Alden House Historic Site Facebook page. Here's Keith Hughes with an all-new Snapshot. Welcome to Snapshot, where we take a local look at the government stories that you may have missed. Last month, the state announced that 234 municipal fire departments will receive $1.8 million in grant funding to support fire education programs for children and older adults across Massachusetts. The Student Awareness of Fire Education, or SAFE, and Senior SAFE grants will be used by local fire departments to teach both children as well as seniors safe fire safety practices. Since the SAFE program began, the average number of children dying in fires has dropped by 78%, which led to the launching of the Senior SAFE program for firefighters to receive funding to provide fire safety education to older adults who face a disproportionate risk of dying in a fire. Duxbury, Kingston, and Plymouth Fire Departments each received a portion of the grant, with Kingston using their portion for visiting students in pre-K through fourth grade to teach fire safety lessons as well as senior center presentations and home visits with smoke and carbon monoxide alarm installations. Plymouth plans to use their funds to partner with the local school system to teach fire safety along with presentations, battery replacements, and smoke and carbon monoxide alarm installations for seniors. Starting this July, Massachusetts residents applying to enroll in MassHealth will be able to indicate a desire to be considered for the SNAP program, which provides benefits to supplement food budgets so that families in need can purchase healthy foods. 
With this change, mass health recipients can apply to take advantage of the federal funded locally administered food assistance program in one step. It's estimated that approximately 600,000 mass health recipients qualify for SNAP but aren't receiving it, either because they don't know about the program, don't know how to apply for it, or there are other obstacles in the process. For more information on the SNAP program, its benefits, and who can apply, visit gettingsnap.org. The Town of Kingston is updating its 2015 hazard mitigation plan and needs your input. The mitigation plan helps the town plan and receive funding for projects that help to reduce the risk of property damage from natural hazards. The town is seeking information from residents to help identify needed projects and update the plan, such as those focused on roadways, seawalls, bridges, and flood-prone areas. The survey also asks what residents feel the most effective channels of communication are to receive emergency information and how prepared they feel when facing a natural hazard event. The survey takes less than five minutes to complete and can be found on the town website, kingstonma.gov. Town meeting season is starting up and first up is Duxbury. Their annual town meeting and special town meeting will be held Saturday, March 12th at 9 a.m. at the Duxbury High School. Check-in will begin at 8 a.m. If you want to read up on the town's fiscal year 2023 budget, you can find it online at town.duxbury.ma.us along with town meeting updates. Thanks for watching this edition of Snapshot. I'm Keith Hughes, and we'll see you next time. The Growing Together Equity and Allyship Initiative at the Duxbury Free Library invites you to the March 24th program, Family Legacies Through Comics with Dave Ortega. The renowned cartoonist interviewed his 101-year-old grandmother and created an intensely personal memoir of her immigration experience, connecting her personal recollections to historical events and the Mexican Revolution. In this presentation, learn about her brush with death, tequila smugglers, and the joy of her magical wedding. Dave will also share his artistic process and a summary of his illustrations and stories. This program, in partnership with the South Shore Art Center, will take place via Zoom and be streamed live on the big screen at the library from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. For more information, visit the Duxbury Free Library website. The art of play has always been a form of learning and exploration. Over time, many cultures have created dolls to use for storytelling, and entertainment, and 17th century pilgrims were no different. On March 12th, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., head to Plymouth Patuxet with your little one to make their very own 17th century poppet, as they were called then, just as the pilgrims would have. All supplies will be included. This program is recommended for ages six and up, and parents are welcome to join in on the fun for free. For tickets, visit Plymouth.org. With warm weather returning soon, so will outdoor farmers markets. One of your local favorites has a new home. The Kingston Farmers Market is excited to announce its new location at Gray's Beach, where you'll be able to shop for fresh and local produce, artisanal soaps, spices, and handcrafted baked goods with the beautiful seaside as your backdrop. Dates will be announced soon. For more information or to become a market vendor, visit their Facebook page or FarmersMarketKingston.com. That wraps this episode of Local Matters. To keep updated on what's good and good to know in our community, follow us on social media at The Local Scene or visit us on PACTV's brand new website with a fresh look, new logos, and a more streamlined experience to make it easier to find the content and information you want to see. That's at www.pactv.org. Take a look. And until next time, from all of us at PACTV, have a safe and happy week.
Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to the local scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.